Hi, I'm John Paul, and yes, I'm very passionate about Patron, Paul Mitchell, Rock, John Paul Pett, and many other things. But more important, I'm very passionate about doing something on this planet and continuing to do it that makes the world a better place to live for others. Enjoy what you're gonna see. I enjoyed this interview with Omar because it gave the opportunity for entrepreneurs to see once again some of the different things you could do to be successful, those that are entrepreneurs, some of the things that really worked in life. And I love sharing the story that helps others become successful. Peace, love, and happiness. Hey guys, welcome to this episode of the Passion If You Podcast today. It's your host, Omar here. And today is a very special day because we get to interview multi-billionaire entrepreneur, John Paul DeJoria. And in this interview, we get into the story of not only how John Paul co-founded Paul Mitchell Systems, which you might know from their shampoo and conditioner at your local salon, but also how John Paul overcame homelessness twice in his lifetime, had a single mother, grew up in LA with not a lot of money, and would go on to not only build a successful company with Paul Mitchell, but also with Patron, who he most recently sold for $5.1 billion. And of course, you guys know me, I had to ask him exactly what he did with the money the day the transaction cleared. So in this interview, we go deep into John Paul's mindset, attitude, and more so than his story, some of the tactical and strategic things that he's used to allow him to become a multi-billionaire in the process. So whatever you're after in life, money, purpose, or peace, there will be something for you. So with no further ado, sit back, relax, maybe you need to have a shot of tequila in this one because you will enjoy a wild interview with none other than multi-billionaire John Paul Joria. Enjoy. Hey guys, welcome to this episode of The Passionate View. Today we have on America's most loved entrepreneur, Mr. John Paul DeJoria himself. Thanks so much for being on the show. Certainly. So growing up, you had some entrepreneurial endeavors that yes. you had no idea would lead to what it would be. But talk to me a little bit about your early start, because you started out, believe it or not, selling encyclopedias. Most people don't know this. Yeah, actually, it was even before that, Omar. Uh, my first entrepreneur job, I was seven years old at the Variety Boys Club in East L.A., and we would go there in the wood shop, and they would give us 25 cents worth of credit, my brother and I, on wood. It'd be enough wood to buy to build a flower box about this big, this wide, rounded on the ends, open on top, flat on the bottom with hooks. You put it on your windowsill, or you could hang it up. And we went out to sell it for 50 cents. Now, this is in the early 50s. Well, it took us two days, I think. We finally found a waitress to buy it from us, which was wonderful. <laughs> and we went back, we paid our 50 cents off. Uh, we paid a quarter, I should say, for the wood. The other quarter, profit, we did another one. We went out and sold it, 50 cents. For two wow. kids that are seven and eight and a half years old, to have 50 cents in those days was a lot of money. It's my first entrepreneur job. Then in the back of a comic book when I was nine years old, I read Christmas cards, we send you a free kit. And all you do is you have four examples. You go around and sell Christmas cards with somebody's name printed in. Now, they're going to give you a 50% deposit. You send that in with the order, okay? But when the order comes in, you deliver it. They'll give you the other 50% and it's yours. Well, that was pretty cool. And I think I sold maybe four or five people. And I thought that was cool. <laughs> How old were you at that time? I was uh, nine years old. Wow. So, then, so already at that age, you're already starting to get the momentum of sales. Yeah. 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 But you see, my era was a little different than today's era. We loved having a job. Other than the flower boxes, we gave most of the money to my mother. At 11 years old, and my brother now was 13 by that time, we had morning paper routes with the LA Examiner. We'd get up in the morning, fold our papers, deliver them before school. And we made about $32, something like that, a month. <laughs> we kept a dollar and a quarter each, go horseback wow. riding, gave the rest to my mom. We just thought it was the coolest thing to have a job. We weren't doing it because we were making this extra money. We knew we were, which would help our family live a better way of life. But it was the fact you could have a job. Well, I've been working ever since. When I got into high school, I'd have a part-time job after school all the time. And then I went to the United States Navy. After I got out of the Navy, it's another, I call it an entrepreneur job, because you're selling encyclopedias door to door. There's <laughs> no salary, commission only, and you pay for your own food and your own expenses. That is tough. Yes. The average encyclopedia salesperson lasts three days. I lasted three and a half years, but I believe what they told me. They said, the people that are going to make it are the ones who will knock on 10 doors. And then if they're close in your face, you're just as enthusiastic on door number 11. 
but you got to do that. Well, it's pretty tough when you're out there, people are closing the door, closing the door. You have nothing unless you sell a set of books. People are not expecting you. There weren't even leads there. Well, I believe what they said. So on door number 101, <laughs> I was just as enthusiastic as the first 100 doors. But it took me about a week before I made my first sale. Then I was happy. Were you always a pretty positive person or did you just learn that, hey, rejection's a part of life and this is going to be a part of anything I ever want to get good at. Did you sort of learn that lesson young about rejection? I was always a pretty positive person. My mom was pretty positive. So I was always pretty positive, but I didn't realize the importance of learning how to overcome rejection till I sold encyclopedias. Mm -hmm. When we were uh, delivering our uh, newspapers in the morning, we also, if we want to go out at night and get an extra customer, we made an extra dollar per new customer we put on, which mm -hmm. was pretty exciting for us. So that was the law entrepreneurs, but as little kids, you're not after 100 doors, you're after five or 10. <laughs> right, yeah. When you're after hundreds of doors, it's a good experience. In fact, uh, I do tell people, two of the most important things you could do as entrepreneurs, in starting a business, or in getting your business doing a little differently, or in working with somebody else, it's the same thing. Whether you work for yourself or someone else, two biggest things you could do to make yourself good is number one, be prepared for a lot of rejection. Kind of the question you asked me. If you're prepared for it and it comes along, it's not gonna bug you as much. Very, very important. The second thing is make sure your service or your product is the very best there is. Then you're in the reorder business, not the selling business. If you wanna go in the selling business just to sell your product, well, that could be a one-time event. If everything you do is for them to like it so much they want to use it again. Or if it's a one-time product, they want to tell their friends about it. Now you're in longevity in your business. Those are two of the secrets. And smile and be happy. Right. Yeah, no, I love that. And you've done that so well and built it into the culture of all of your businesses. Now, I want to ask you, did your motivation, your drive, your hunger, obviously it's quite intense compared to most people's. Do you feel like it was rooted in the fact that you had a single mother and you were always... Maybe you, you had a you know a chip on your shoulder, you were trying to prove something to the world? Or was it just your natural personality? You just wanted to be really good at things and so you excelled in sales? I never had to prove anything in the world. I was what I was. We were immigrants, single mom, dad was a deadbeat dad, and he took off before I was two years old. It was just something we were around a positive environment. Uh, we didn't have any money, and we lived in a very small little dinky <laughs> place in that go park. Yeah. But we were happy. We were just positive. It wasn't anything that was to prove anything to anybody, just that's just how it is. And if, if you take a look at life, you can have your glasses, they say, half empty or half full, it's how you look at it. Now, I've been homeless twice. When you are down how old and out, first time was 22 years old, and I had a child, homeless with a kid, you know, wow. he's a couple years old, my Which God. would be interesting, because most people see you now in this multi-billion dollar situation, they would never believe that at 22, you uh, were homeless with a kid. I mean, it didn't look like the trajectory was heading here, right? Yep. Yeah. But when you're down and out and you're that far down and you've got a kid and you're kicked out of your place because rent's due, you don't have the money and your wife took off with everything. Took off uh, with everything? It, everything, yeah. Just little kids. Wow. Anyways, we yeah. were just too young to get married. Uh, so you know how to make it. Now, when you're that low, I've had a friend of mine who's a blues singer said, when you get down so low and you look up, all you can see is an ant, right? <laughs> well, when you're that low, you can only go up. Mm -hmm, true. So instead of, you have a choice. You could sit around and blame what happened to you on everybody else, which is usually what people do. Or say, hey, that's how things turned out. Now I'm going to turn things around. Another very important thing, when you're down and out, first thing people do is blame it on everybody else but yeah, themselves. So true. When you start taking responsibility, you have a little different outlook. You also have the responsibility of turning things around. When I started Paul Mitchell, I was homeless once again, totally by accident. <laughs> and I, I started to cut me out of the backseat of my car. How old were you at that time? 37 uh, or something? That was 34, 35 at that time. So you were homeless at 34, 35 yeah. again. Yeah. And what was this series of events that led to that second time? It was just that we had money set up, a half a million bucks. Mm -hmm. We needed to start the company with that kind of money. And uh, the day I was ready to start, go down to the bank and get the money, and my partner, the hairdresser, Paul Mitchell, flew over from Hawaii with his girlfriend, and uh, we were ready to get the money and get going and get started. I'd left everything I did. My relationship wasn't working out, so I left the house. Plenty of money for many months with her. Had a few hundred bucks in my pocket. Took the used car, which is 20 years old, but a decent <laughs> one, okay, down yeah. the hill to get the money. Wow. I was going to check into an efficiency. It all set up. The money never came in. No way. Never, the guy changed his mind. 1980. 
81. Yeah. Inflation in the United States is 12.5%. Interest rates, if you could get a loan, prime rate, 17%. Wow. We stayed in line to get gasoline and interest uh, and unemployment was 10.5% in the United States. The guy said, your hostages are still in Iran, which they were at that time. He says, is this a terrible, I'm sorry, it's the last minute, no. So it was a matter of, what are we gonna do? Paul came over, he was a little older than me. He was on his last few dollars. And uh, what are we gonna do? Paul, what can you afford? How did you meet Paul to begin with? I met Paul nine years prior in the beauty industry. Uh, a mutual friend of ours uh, had introduced us at a big beauty show, big beauty show. We just became the best of friends. So for nine years, when he or he and his girlfriend come over to me in the United, uh, continental United States, they'd stay with me in my guest room. When I went to Hawaii, he would go in his guest room, which was a Volkswagen bust with flat wheels in front of his little teeny <laughs> beach house, and let my wife and I have the little beach house at the time. We're just the best of friends and decided to go into business with each other. Yeah, and so at what point was it where you guys said, huh, you know what, we might be onto something here with these Paul Mitchell's you know, shampoo and conditioners, which you guys came to be known for. What was the point where you guys said, hmm, like, let's do this? Like, what was the Well, was we were planning to do it because I knew the business. I was in marketing, sales, and structure and had connections with uh, product development. And I didn't do hair. Paul was a great hairdresser, one of the best in the world. Very advanced in what he did. However, he didn't do business. It was the perfect combination for these two guys <laughs> together. We're just the best of friends. Yeah. And we knew we could do it. Uh, obviously, we started out with nothing. We made the decision, let's just, do it. let's just make this happen. And as you will see, and your guests will see when they look at Good Fortune, the movie, and it's on, iTunes, it's on Amazon, all those. But when they look at it, it's the whole story of starting in America with nothing a couple times and making things happen because of what you believe in. But the important thing is, even when we had nothing, we started giving back. Whether it was the first company to say we will never test on animals and never have to this state. Wow. Or other things we did. I want to shake your hand to that. Sure, you betcha, man. I applaud you to that. That's yeah, awesome. It's still going on that one. Oh, very cool. Now, when it comes to you actually wanting to grow the business, did you guys start it with the intention that we want to build this big? Or was it like, let's just test the waters? Because up until that point, you probably had no experience of the kind of success that Paul Mitchell would grow to be. So was the intention to build a big business or was it just to sell to salons and just grow and see Good what happens? Good question. We knew we would only sell it to beauty salons. And the reason we picked that area was two reasons. One, if a hairdresser who's in hair all the time likes your product, they're gonna recommend it to their customer to take care of their hair in between visits to look the same. They're the experts. And we didn't have a major multi-million dollar advertising budget going the other direction. I had been for those last eight years, nine years in the professional beauty industry. Of course, Paul was also. What a perfect, beautiful industry to go into. And I knew that I could knock door to door and sell my products without an advertising campaign. We had no money. Mm. Now, you Would want you to learn from selling encyclopedias. Oh yeah, learn from, exactly. Learn from selling encyclopedias how to do it <laughs> without an appointment. Yeah. However, our motivation when we started was not to have a giant company. Our motivation to start with was survival. Mm. Survival, I thought, <laughs> I have nothing, I left everything I'm doing, right. and God, let's just give it a shot here. I'll sleep in my car, we know our products were darn good. If people used them, they want to reorder them, let's go for it. It took us two years before we knew we would be successful. Our dream when we started out was, if we could only get this company up to $5 million a year, We'd each make about a quarter of a million dollars, $250,000. We have it made for life. We're so excited, right? Yeah. Then as things rolled, I learned how to be a little better businessman. Right. As we got bigger and bigger, I brought other people on board to run operations. Other people are much better than I to run other parts of the business. That was They were more qualified to do. And we had no idea. In fact, when Paul died back in 1989 of pancreatic cancer, and we were together, he said, I believe in the afterlife. I believe that my spirit will go out and I'll be able to look down on this planet Earth. He said, gosh, JP, it'd be so wonderful if one day out there, there could be a hundred thousand you know, dollars worth of Paul Mitchell. I mean, a hundred million dollars worth of Paul. We could be a hundred million dollar company one day. Oh my God, would this be wonderful? You know, What if we could do this, JP? I'm gonna look down and watch it. I said, Paul, I'm gonna build this company to at least a hundred million dollars. A little extra motivation there. And needless right. to say, we went way beyond that. But it, it was good. Yeah. 
That's good incredible. intentions. And then also, I know that you came to be known for your sales pitch, right? And that became sort of what you were coined for in the industry. Um, can you talk a little bit about what your pitch was when training either yourself initially or when training your salespeople to go into the store, put it in their hand? I know you have a sort of routine you used to do. Do you mind sharing that routine? Sure, no, no. The first thing is, it could not be a sales pitch. If you're selling somebody with a sales pitch, you're trying to create a sales. When you're trying to sell somebody something, instead of selling it to them, help them make the right decision and put yourself in the reorder business. For example, selling is all about, here is the feature of my product and here's how it's gonna benefit you. Make sure that those features and benefits are honest. Don't go lying to people. Don't exaggerate. Here's the feature of the product. Here's how it's gonna benefit you. With our Paul Mitchell conditioner, because it was leave-in conditioner, I could put some in their hand, right? Now, once it went in their hand, they didn't know what to do with it. And I could finish explaining. We have two hands out like this, their hand and my yeah. hand. I could finish explaining and they don't know what the world to do with this, right? But I have their full attention. I set a bottle down. They say, by the way, rub your hands together. It neutralizes all the chemicals in your body. Put it on your skin. It's very good for your skin. It's a leave-in conditioner. There's all these great things. So that was part of the technique. And then obviously the other part was you want to help people make the right decision. Right. Often people will say to you, uh, no. They're not really saying no. They're saying I haven't been convinced. Mm, so it's very, it's very, very important in sales to realize this. In our case, we have every line in the world. Why do we want a new line that no one knows? Okay. And for us, we would say because this product saves you time and money. One shampoo instead of two. A leave-in conditioner opposed to one. You've got to spend 10 minutes in the back basin waiting and then rinsing it out of their hair. Saves you time and money. It's new and exciting. And I will come back, show you how to sell it. And if in a period of one month, it's not the hottest product and you're not totally satisfied, I will take back every bottle you haven't used or sold out the door and give you your money back. Now, that's fair enough, isn't it? Right. And you would not just like that. Oh, yeah. And I would give them their money back. Yeah. I believe in our first two years, only one bottle came back. So when you first asked that, because I, I want to ask, when you first made that offer, was part of you kind of nervous? Like, oh, man, I hope they don't take it back. Or was it genuine confidence? It was genuine the confidence. There was no doubt in our minds. Our product is so good. If you use it as a hairdresser, you want to use it again and again and again. And we were right. Again, within the first two years, only one bottle came back. That's incredible. And then I know, too, that that's at the center of your ethos, right, of always having quality products. Same happens with uh, Patron. You guys went in and revolutionized an industry that before then a lot of people thought, oh, you can't go premium or it can't be done. And you, Sir John Paul, did it. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit about why you think entrepreneurs typically don't do that or why, you know, what is it that entrepreneurs don't get about that? Because it seems so intuitive that you have the best products. Is it just cutting costs? I mean, what is it do you think that holds most entrepreneurs back from really putting out quality stuff in the market? It's a combination of several things. One, obviously, is the cost. And number two is your thinking, your mindset. If your mindset is to sell something to somebody, that's your business, that's your mindset. If your mindset is, I want to be in the reorder business. Mm. And if it's a one-time sale, I want it to be so good they're going to tell their friends about it. When you have that mindset, well, what's going to create a reorder? I like the product so much, I want to use it again. Now, it doesn't mean that you have to go the cheapest or the most expensive. It means you have to have the best or conceived as one of the best or something that satisfies their needs. It's like marketing is fulfilling a need in the marketplace, but in such a way that your sister, your brother, your best friend's going to use that product and say, this is really good. I want to go out of my way to order it again. Salons, how often do people go to salons? I think the average is once every... Oh, gosh, uh, for those that go once every six weeks, something like that, you know, to get a haircut, get a trim. Right. Well, in between, do they want to make sure they have enough when they go back to get enough to last for the next visit? Got to be a good product for that. Yeah, no, that One that works. Sense. That's why Paul Mitchell, my gosh, you know, we're uh, we'll be approaching next year uh, almost 40 years in business. Wow. And our original product, Shampoo One, Shampoo Two, and the conditioner, we still sell. The products are that good. And in my industry, every three or four years, you flip products over. Our products are that good that people say, I want to continue to use it. It's still the best. Still timeless. Wow. Okay. So as you're growing your business, because a lot of entrepreneurs watch the show, and I want to ask this for them. A lot of entrepreneurs will say, well, whoa, you built something that's just so intangible in my mind. 
Would you say that as you grow, as you scale your business, there was many times where you were like, man, I have no idea what I'm doing, right? You sort of assume the role. I mean, how many times in your career growing as, you know, what people would see as a multi-billionaire who has it all together, how much of the time are you really just sort of figuring it out as you go, as opposed to knowing what you're doing every step of the way for people out there? I knew some of the stuff I was doing, but especially how to run and get involved in a company that did more than four $5 million a year, let alone to the hundreds of millions, billion, <laughs> uh, you know, the value of this company, my God, you learn along the way. I kept on learning and trying to do everything. After about nine years, I realized, man, I could only do so much. That's when I brought in people like Luke Jacobellis, who was far more experienced than I was in running warehouses, running inventories and things of that nature. And all of a sudden, then he had this responsibility. Another person was great at this, and they had that responsibility. So you have to learn, once you get pretty big, how to find the very best people, better than you are. I say to management all the time, whether it's government management, independent management, or corporate management when I lecture, always find somebody in your department or in your business that can do it better than you are and hire that person. <laughs> I tell my division heads here at, at all, all the companies I'm involved with, guys, even though you're full operations, you run the businesses for me, make sure this, that when you hire someone, that person you hire has the capability of being better than you. Now, what if they go on and you don't go on? You are one of my best managers. Any manager that has the brains to hire someone better than they are and has a better capability, that's the kind of person I want on board for the future. Mm, I love that. Now, let me ask you this. What's your process for decision making? Obviously, a business is big whether it's hiring, building a culture, uh, choosing colors, logos, ads, marketing, you have to make lots of decisions all the time without all the pieces of information. Uh, what's been your rule of thumb or what have you learned after decades of making decisions? What is John Paul DeJoria's you know, system for effective decision making? Well, I'm very lucky now because with all my various companies, whether it's Patron, whether it's Paul Mitchell, uh, John Paul Pett, Rock Mobile, whatever, I have great managers, great presidents, great people that make some very, very good decisions. However, I'll commit at more of a creative end, a PR end, and say, hmm, here's my input on this, not on everything, but on some of the things. And I go by, how do I feel? You know, how does my spirit feel about it? How do I initially feel? My intuition. Yeah, you know, you know how do I feel exactly? Mm -hmm. You know, what's, what's my intuition on this one then? Does it make sense? And then from a consumer's point of view, if I was this person, how would I look at it? And all too often I'm saying, by the way, that eight and 10 point type make it bigger. I want people to read it without their glasses on. Well, that's that's what I'm Oh, no, JP's coming. You better increase that a little bit. Yeah. But I have really great people that do most of that big decision making. But for me, is what, what's that intuition? How do I feel about it? How do I think others will feel about it? Is it priced properly? And is it extremely great? And I will use just about every product on myself. Uh, whether it was Patron that I built over the years, how do I like the taste yeah, of this? Yeah, yeah. I, but, you I'm know, working right now. Yeah, yeah. you know, work, excuse me, <laughs> with Paul Mitchell. Other than, you know, obviously, not, I don't have a permanent wave, so there's a lot of products we have I don't use on me. John Paul Pet, I used every product on me. And wow. I don't have ticks, so yeah. they're fleeing tick shampoo probably weren't pretty good for the dogs yeah. and cats. But I, I would use the products on me, too, to give them my opinion. Nice. How about on your way up when you didn't have managers in place and you had to make decisions? What was your system? Was it really just that intuition? A big my part system of it? was intuition and, uh-oh, who do I call to see what they would do? But it was mm. usually my intuition. And uh, I was very lucky most of the time I was right, but many times I was wrong. That's very interesting that you, you say You learn from that. your mistakes. Yeah, that's true. And it's very interesting that you say that because a lot of people you know, who built big businesses will say that. Mm -hmm. Hey, I didn't know all the information. So anytime I hit a roadblock, it was a matter of who, not how. Right. Who can I find? How important do you find networking is or building a resource of people, a Rolodex of people who can help you, support you? How important is it to build your network? If I had that in the early days, it would have been great. I didn't have it in the early days. So most of, let's say, the first five years are just my intuition of what I thought would be right. And if I didn't have an answer, I would try something. And again, luckily, I was right most of the time. And there were times where I wasn't right. But it all <laughs> came out okay. Yeah. And then how about meditation? Was it ever something that was a part of your life or a, the, a routine of meditation or anything like that? I think the closest meditation for me is the majority of times I'll wake up in the morning, do what most people do, go to the bathroom, right. go right back to bed and just take a couple of minutes to be in the here and now. Now that's difficult because I'm not a regular meditator. Well, how do you be in the here and now? That's almost like a meditation where your mind is totally blank. Well, you could sit up in your room and just have your mind blank. Hard to do because things rush through your head. So what do I do? I look at the ceiling. Oh, that's the ceiling. Oh, that's the pain. That's the TV set. 
to just focus here. Then I focus on air going in me, air going out of me. As I do things like that, then all of a sudden, for a couple of minutes, I blank my mind out, period. Then I go about my day. You become more present, more tuned to the moment. Just for a matter of a couple of minutes is fine. And then you go right through. So talk to me a little bit about Patron. Obviously, you know, Paul Mitchell had built this massively successful business mm -hmm. for you guys, and then you add Patron to the mix. Mm -hmm. How did that come about? What was the start of that? Because I know most recently there was an acquisition uh, in early January with Bacardi. It was actually in May. It, 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 it finished yes. in April and May of this yes. year. Yeah, there was a very large acquisition. It was the biggest in the industry ever. Yes, in I heard history. it was $5.1 billion. Is that $5.1 billion valuation, that's correct. So I got to ask you, what does it feel like the morning that the, the acquisition's done and that hope clears, you wake up, the deal's done? How do you feel First that thing I morning? did was immediately, once I knew it was in the bank, I wrote a check for $50 million to charity. It's the first thing I did, period. And then put all the money away for the future. I have enough yeah. to handle things now. I don't want to play with this money for the next year. I gave it to experts to take care of it for them to manage the money. I have enough to exist off the money I make right now. And this way, I don't do something stupid. A lot of people get a lot of money. They're putting it here yeah. and there. And I just let me give to the experts. You guys take care of that. That's for my future. Other than I'm pulling $50 million out for charitable work now for people that really need it. And is there any part of you at times that goes back to that young kid growing up in Echo Park, L.A., uh, maybe the tough times along the way sleeping in your car, where you wake up and pinch yourself and go, whoa, how, how did this happen? Is there, no, is there but constantly I'm saying, creator of souls, thank you for this incredible life you've given me and the health of me and my family and happiness. Thank you so much. Let me go forth and do good things to make the planet better because I'm here. Mm -hmm. And you feel like that energy is what keeps things flowing, correct? No, that energy is just what I feel. I don't do to keep things flowing, just what I feel. And I just give that gratitude. And whether you're an atheist or whether you believe in God, let's right. call it God for now, or creator of souls, right. right? Is we're all part of that. And maybe some of us have been given a little extra, whether you call it good luck or God opportunities to go along with, or just something that was good in our lives or a good break in life, whatever, to make something happen. Success unshared is failure. Often people make so much as to make more and more and more and more, but don't share it with people. And that's sad. So success and shared is failure. And when you're making it and you're doing good, you're happy with yourself. Mm, powerful. And then um, I know I asked about Patron, but if we can get into a little bit of that. Um, what, what was the seed or how did Patron start? What was the... Sitting around with Martin Crowley, uh -huh. who was... Going down to Mexico, I, he went and gone bankrupt in the hospitality business, so a friend introduced him to me, and I put him in the architectural business. He'd go to Mexico, buy furniture and pavers, come to the United States and sell it to restaurants or architects for their model homes, right? A little niche business. We were doing pretty good, and I was building a house there in Malibu for my family for the future. And I said, Martin, when you go down there, we need some pavers and some things here, and some, you know, uh, steel, some wood, whatever, especially granite, you know, and different stone that's ground for these pillars. Go down there and see, you know, what the price is. But by the way, so we were drinking tequila at that time. We, we made a margarita. I said, <laughs> right. see what the Mexican people drink, the aristocrats drink, and maybe bring back a bottle or two. He goes, okay. So he went down there with one of my builders, Jack, and they went across this one uh, place and brought back a couple of bottles in this very thin, long bottle. It was the smoothest I ever tasted in my life. Really? And then Martin says, but JP, I met this guy named Francisco Alcarez that works for this little distillery. He says he could make it even smoother. Now this little distillery will make it for us with Francisco's little touch in there. They're gonna charge us some money because it's expensive to make, but we go into business. I thought, great, if we can make it smoother, <laughs> let's do it. Yeah. I'll order a thousand cases. What year is this? This is 1989, early 1989. Wow. I'll, bar, I'll uh, order 1,000 cases, which was 12,000 bottles, and let's see what happens. And if nobody bought it, well, for 10 years, every gift you could imagine is a great bottle of tequila. <laughs> Martin and right. Alan, who was with them, found this bottle that was uh, out of recycled glass. I thought, God, if we could do this out of recycled glass, it goes along with my philosophy. Yeah, we can make them out of recycled glass. And yeah. at first, no one wanted our product. The average tequila sold for about 4 or $5 a bottle. The best one was about $14 a bottle back in 1989. Because of the quality and what we put into it, we had to sell it for thirty-seven ninety-five a bottle. Wow. No one would touch us. No distributor would touch us. But it was staying true to your ethos yep. of premium quality, and the market will adjust to the premium. Forget That's correct. About what and when you yeah. went, I went to Wolfgang Puck. 
He had Spagos. He was a friend of mine. Yeah. He goes, JP, this is the best I've ever had. Wolf, will you sh- sh- give it to your celebrity? Sure, JP, give me a few <laughs> bottles. You know, and Martin went to Ba Cantina. Yeah. We kind of built it like that. Ground roots like encyclopedia sales. Where did you come up with the name Patron? Martin and Ilana were, were coming up with names and found it. They said, I think the name Patron mean like the boss, the good Patron, boss, yeah, right? Yeah, the yeah. good boss, right? Is available. He said, well, Christ, let's go for it. Here's extra money. Try and get it. He said, we can get a trademark and trademark and trademark it. <laughs> we did. Yeah. And then later on, we found there was someone in Mexico that had something called Reserva del Patron, whatever. Yeah. And of course, we gave them money to buy that out. Right. It was, it was brilliant. It was just a brilliant name. And then how long did it take from when thing, you, know, you started to things took off? I know you gave me the rundown of the story, but what was the timeline before you really started seeing a momentum of sales? And went, I'd say the momentum of sales probably didn't really happen big time until mm, towards the middle of uh, oh, 1990s, around the middle. We started, we did okay, and we were doing good, but right around the middle of, uh, is when we started going to 50,000, 60,000 cases a year, and that's when it started really going. Now, when she really took off was in 1993, when uh, Martin unfortunately died. I'm sorry, 2003. Martin had died, uh, and... Ed Brown, who was our vice president of sales, who should have been president, I immediately made him president. (laughs) And he put into it everything. For example, we pulled out the models he was using, girls as models, and made Patron the image, not pretty girls, right? Mm, Not not pretty girls, right? And he redid our entire team. Then it all of a sudden started taking off like that. Well, no one had any idea in the world we would become, by dollar volume, the largest tequila company in the world and stay all high-end. That's incredible, too. Never that, give up. We could make more money if we had less of a product quality. Never gave up. Never gave up. I huh? never tweaked on your laurels. Never tweaked on it. Nope. Only made it better and better and better. That's a real secret. Keep your product so good, people want to reorder it. Now, since that time, since we started, there's got to be two, 250 tequila companies that have come out. Right. None of them close to Patron. Mm-hmm. I believe our closest competitor that's owned by a giant company did close to 500,000 uh, cases. We did far in excess of three million. <laughs> far in excess. At, at the peak, uh, how many cases a year were you guys selling? Far in excess of three million. I'm, I'm sure by now it's probably over four million. Yeah. And then how did you feel when you started singing ingrained into the culture, right? Yeah. Songs, Patron on Ice, you can have whatever you like, you know? Oh, happy. Are like you, over 200 <laughs> hip hop songs have been written about a country, yes. Western songs, popular songs. Very happy, excited. We didn't pay for it. Really? So you didn't? No, tr- you didn't no, try to no, do no, 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 no. When we went, to the yeah, culture. we went to some of these people and said, and I went to some of the rap singers. This is so cool. Why? They said, JP, because we love your product. We love Patron, and it's in our culture now. It makes you feel good. A lot of us drink some Patron and not do some of the drugs. So we get kind of that same feeling, and because it's so good, we don't get sloppy drunk. But we try and drink responsibly. So good. Keep that responsible <laughs> drinking up. You know. Keep that in there. And then was part of your guys' design, too, to make the bottle different, to make it totally different? I mean, what was the what was the thought process behind the design of the, the bottle? The thought process in the beginning was they brought me a bottle that Elon and Martin found that was out of recycled glass that looked like that. We thought, that's perfect. It looks yeah. like something old that a pirate, an old tequila, or a Patron would have, yeah. right? And at first, we had a glass a topper on it with cork, and then that kept on separates. We just went pure cork and made it cool looking and never changed. I never looked back. Nope. Okay, how about the tough times? Because we've talked a lot about the successes. Yeah. Talk to me about some challenges that maybe maybe you haven't shared before. It could be financial, it could be whatever, just managing so many moving parts. Talk to me about some of the toughest challenges you've dealt with maybe that you haven't shared before and how you overcame them, maybe well, one or a, two. A, a lot of them we've, we've shared before, but perhaps one or two may not have, but your viewing audience will pick it up if they've heard it before. One was in the very beginning was survival. When you only have a few hundred dollars in your pocket, in my case, too proud to tell my mom who lived in LA, mom, I'm going to my room, it's empty, feed me for the next few months, okay? <laughs> yeah. I've left everything behind, I have no money. That was tough, I had to live in my car and learn how to live off $2.50 a day, and I did it. How long and that's challenging. How long were you living in the car at that time? Two weeks in the car, yeah. and then Joanna Pettin, an actress of the day, giving me a room in her house, found that I was living in my car, <laughs> found me, and then still I was living off $2.50 a day. Yeah for breakfast and for dinner. It was some tough times. And then to call people every month for almost two years, the check, I'll deliver it next day. (laughs) It's in the mail. Yeah, Yeah. JP, I'll come down. It took two years. A lot of people say with all your challenges and your bills are late and you can't sleep a night, and that's true. There were nights I could not sleep because I knew I couldn't pay the bills. 
Now, did that help me? No, <laughs> it doesn't do any help, but you're just worried about it. Right, exactly. And so I tell people, hey, if that happens to you, write on a piece of paper all these problems in your life, whether they're personal or business, that keep you from sleeping, what's going through your head over and over again. Write on a piece of paper and just tape it to your bathroom mirror. And now say, hey, don't have to think about it. It'll be there in the morning. And you, you rest more easier. Big challenge was how to survive when you have no money, but we pulled it off. Mm -hmm. And then how about in terms of you, when you sort of later in your career, you've experienced all these different things. What have you found to be the most meaningful experiences of your life? Because from the outside looking in, you know, I'm sure you get it all the time. People think, oh, billionaire. They have no idea that there's so much more to it. What have you found to be some of the most rewarding or fulfilling experiences? Is it employees? Is it the customers? I mean, obviously, it's not just the money. No, uh, it's so a combination. Where does the greatest joy come from? Combination of many things. One, my customers love us, and we have a retention of most all of our customers because they love what we do. They love what we stand for. They love our culture. A big deal is people love our culture about giving back, whether it's for Waterkeeper Alliance, the Sea Shepherd, uh, Mobile Lobes and Fishes, taking the homeless off the streets, or just all the things we do now on a global basis to give back. They really like that and appreciate that, and that gets me off. My staff members, I think we only have around a, maybe a turnover of close to 100 people in 30 nine years almost that's it no way Pe yep people love what that we do wow. we love the way we work with them very proud of my people i'm their people they're my people very very proud and very very proud of having the ability to make extra money where i could give back and change the world in fact a project's going on right now where i've always wanted to change the world for millions of people for better now i've got some projects going on where i'll be changing the life of hundreds of millions of people to do better in life and upgrade their economic situation. And that makes me very, very happy that what That's I'm amazing. doing is good and I'm proud of. Now, along the way, there's challenges. People want to take advantage. Of course, I've yeah. been sued several times, all frivolous lawsuits. But he's a billionaire, so he must be at fault, right? <laughs> all these frivolous, and I have to fight him. What a pain. And I'm singled out because I have all this money, right? right, right. Which is stupid. Right, yeah. They're frivolous lawsuits. But other people run across the same because he's got money, maybe he's bad, let's get part of it. That's big, the biggest disappointment is frivolous lawsuits for people saying, well, he didn't do the right things, he's a billionaire. Look, we're yeah, gonna sue him. He must have cheated somebody Oh yeah, there's 12 the people we're yeah. gonna sue, but let's only get him because he's got the money. That, that's a downside. Other than that, it's wonderful to be able to give back and, and be careful with people because people will do that to you. And for entrepreneurs or leaders listening, how did you build the culture to the staff and employees? Obviously, as you grow and scale, it's about putting the right people in place. Sure. You can't be there. But what, what tips would you give entrepreneurs out there who are looking to build a culture for their organization, their company, their business? How do you create a culture like that and transcend it uh, to where you know, people want to stay? Good question. Be a culture of heart. How would you like to be treated if you could be treated? I worked for companies where the guy said, do it this way. Well, why? Just do it. Well, that's not how you manage people. You work with them. I can remember times I worked for others where things weren't really good in my life and maybe had a dollar for lunch. You couldn't buy very much for a dollar. So no problem. The minute we could afford it, everyone that worked at Paul Mitchell gets free lunch. They still do. And they really? order off menus and they still do. Wow. They still do. Okay, so you look at what people need, what people want. Profit sharing, healthcare, we provide all of that for our people. So they're happy they could grow, they have a savings account that we participate in with profit sharing. We make people happy. We grow together because we look at what would they like? How can we treat them? We had a good year, let's give some bonuses out. Mm -hmm. And I think what you're saying really is how would you wanna be treated? Exactly. If you were them, how would you want your employer to treat you? And you just sort of reverse engineer and line that up. And by example, like we're very giving. You know, we do so many, we must turn down every month many, many requests because we do too many. I think by last <laughs> count, this is JP, you've given to 167 different causes. Stop. We don't have the time, the energy. You, just, you know, okay, yeah. so we slow down a little bit here <laughs> on doing that. Yeah. But we keep on giving. Now, yeah. our staff feels it. They love being part of giving, okay? So one day I came here last year and everyone was gone but the receptionist. Where did we go this afternoon? Oh, JP, they all volunteered to go down to, and this was the California office, to go down to Santa Monica and clean up the beaches. I said, wow, that's great. They said they do it all the time. They volunteered to do it because it's the thing to do. 
Now, I'm not at that office very much. Maybe once every three weeks, I'll come to California and come in for a day or two and shake hands, do a little bit of public relations. But yeah. they're doing it without me being here watching. Didn't even know about it. That's beautiful. Our schools, this is the greatest example. Oh, the Paul Mitchell schools. We have that, in maybe. the United States now over 100, maybe close to 120 Paul Mitchell schools. Part of our curriculum is giving back. Our schools participate in fundraisers, and they raise a lot of money. We have raised today in the last 15 years millions of dollars. I think the average is maybe a couple million a year at least. These wow. are students. Half the money stays in the local community. The other half goes to great causes for the United States and other parts of the world. So they learn while they're in school. Joyous things like a car wash to raise money, a cut-a-thon. They come up with all kinds of ways. Yeah. Every dime they raise goes to the charity. Every dime they raise to our Paul Mitchell School Charities. We, the school department, underwrite the entire charity. So every dime it costs to run it, operate it, administer it is either done by volunteers or we pay for it. Every dime goes to it. So they learn as part of the curriculum the joy of giving back. Will some of these children ever meet the survivors, these little children whose parents have died of AIDS, right. ages one day to 12 years old in Africa, that people wanted to throw away, that we save their lives and educate them, give them a place to live? No, but they know they did something for somebody else asking nothing in return and how good it feels. That's our Paul Mitchell School culture and boy does it work and it makes people better off. Sometimes children or adult children can talk to their parent where they haven't talked to their parent in many years. They learn how to communicate. It's all about giving back and loving one another and just being selfish for yourself and not caring about the other person thinks. It's part of the culture we teach in our schools and of course with our company. That's beautiful. And it seems like you were always like that because even when you didn't have money, I read something, I think it was an article where you mm -hmm. said, even when you didn't have money, that you would still give a dime if you had it. You know, if oh, you yeah. were to give a dime out of a dollar, you're not going to do oh. it when I'm a billionaire or when I'm rich, I'll give. At you know? Christmas time. And that's also in good fortune. How my mom, we had nothing. We gave a dime to the Salvation Army and why <laughs> we did and what mom said. And that always stuck with me. And even in my days when I used to ride with the Satan slaves and the Hell's Angels when I was in, in California. You were a rebel, weren't you, JP? Well, let's just say I was, you know, it was a, it was a different time. <laughs> free spirited. It's different times. Yeah. Okay, I used to ride with them. Were you, you know, free spirited in the 60s? Was cool. I was just, let's just say I, I went through the 60s for whatever I did. <laughs> okay. But even during those times, uh, I would go to Griffith Park and they would have feed ins at Thanksgiving and at Christmas time where I would just go there and want to volunteer to be on the line to serve people food for Thanksgiving or Christmas. And there were lines of people, you know, going all over the park, but we would serve them free food and made me feel good. I did something to give back. Absolutely. And we actually have an event. Um, we have these Passion Pay shirts where we actually, for every shirt purchase, we donate a meal and a shirt to the homeless in need for Great. the holidays. Yeah. Great. So, so we're very aligned with you in that one. Um, I want to ask a couple last questions here before we wrap up. So there's a lot of entrepreneurs watching, and a lot of them are sitting here wondering, like, what was JP's mindset? What was his motivation? So I want to ask, obviously, you wanted to create a great product, a reorderable product, serve people, help Correct. the world. But how much of it was, I want to make a lot of money? I mean, even if that was a parallel motivation, mm -hmm. was that in there or not really? Was that kind of a byproduct? I mean, obviously, it was important. Mm -hmm. But did you have the aspiration for hundreds of millions or billions? Or was that not really the dialogue? What was inside the, your head? Absolutely not. The whole thing is if we could only do $5 million a year, Paul, we'd make a quarter of a million each, yeah. we're set for life. And then as the company grew, then we realized, hey, not only could the company grow, but we could actually do things like maybe buy a nice house one day, maybe buy a new car. I never owned a new car in my life until 1985, and we started Paul Mitchell in 1980. It was the first time I had enough money and felt confident enough to actually buy my first new car. It was like, yay, I bought a new car. What was your <laughs> America first, works. What was your first splurge? First, A new car. My what? first splurge was a new car. I bought a new car. Sports car? No, no, it was a sedan, but it was a new one. It was a Mercedes. It was a Mercedes, oh and I, boy, I just felt like on top of the world, like uh, Janis Joplin had a song, oh, yeah. Lord, won't you buy me a Mercedes Benz, you know? Yeah, and you're just playing the music loud, finally living the American dream. So that was speak. great. Well, the American dream to me is to be happy, have the opportunity, whether you're working for someone else or whether you start your own business, to be happy and be able to have enough money to buy yourself a house and live okay. That's the American dream and have a shot at having a big business or little business on your own and making some money for a better life for your family. That's a dream to keep on going up, having an opportunity. That dream is still alive. Today, inflation is not 
12 and a half percent. Right. Unemployment is not 10 and a half percent. Interest rates are not 17 percent lowest interest rate. And our employment today, my God, is less than 4%, you know? So they have a better opportunity today to be able to start a business than ever before and you have the internet. In my day, you didn't. And we had telephones we would dial or push the button on. We didn't have all cell phones. The cell yeah. phones were this big. If you could afford one, I think yeah. when we were four or five years in business, I bought one of those big ones. <laughs> So when you see the generation now, you think, man, you guys have so many tools. You have no excuse to not no, get moving, right? No, no, right? sure, no. So, okay, when you see entrepreneurs now, what do you think most of them are doing ineffectively? Because I'm sure at this level, you've dealt with many CEOs who do really well. You've seen people crash and burn. What, are you, what do you notice are patterns of executives or leaders who build companies that actually work? Does it speak just to what you've already said about quality products, putting people first? I mean, what is the common denominator among companies and leaders that succeed versus those who constantly fail? It's all that you said, but I would throw in their rejection. And it's only human nature. When people keep rejecting your friends, your family, this is not going to work. You shouldn't be doing this. Do something else. No, the person doesn't want to buy it. If you know your product or your service is the best you could possibly do and you will overcome rejection, you're gonna have a heck of a good chance of making it. Having that positive attitude of drive, drive, drive. Look at uh, Fred Smith, Federal Express. Several times he was turned down. He just kept on going for it. Now it's just a huge company. But there are many companies like that, to give you an example, many. You gotta stick with what you believe in. Some are gonna make it and some won't. I've started other entrepreneur jobs along the way or businesses that just didn't make it, but you learn. Yeah, and of course, we only hear about the successes. That's correct. We only hear about the Paul Mitchells and the Patrons. That's correct. So, okay, quick question. What's the worst advice you've ever gotten in your career? Oh, I got a lot of bad advice. Mike, I couldn't tell you the worst because there were probably several worst, worst, worst <laughs> suggestions. Like, oh, put some money in that, and it just didn't work out. There, there yeah. were several on the way. I, I couldn't pick out any one as, a, as, as the worst one, but there's several. We all get several things. We make a decision, and oh, my God, I was given advice, and that was wrong. All you do is learn from it. Try not to make that same mistake again. And if you make it a second time, shame on you. Make sure there's never a third. <laughs> <laughs> What's the best advice that you would give somebody else looking to build a big business, build a meaningful business, impact the world? What would be, John Paul, looking back on your years, what would be your best advice to people out there looking to make their life work? A combination of make your product or service the best it is so you can be in the reorder business, not in the order business. Number two, don't give up, be prepared for a lot of rejection. And then remember, successful people do all the things unsuccessful people don't want to do, like work from morning till night, work on the weekends, not give up. And the most important thing is as you grow, remember this, success unshared is failure. You want to be happy in your life and take care of your people. Mm, I love that. Okay. Now, this is the last question before we play a game. So typically at the end of every interview, we play a game called First Things First. Mm -hmm. Uh, where I rifle off 10 words or phrases, and it's like a relation game. You tell me the first word or phrase that comes to mind. But before that, I have one last question. And that is, for people watching this that have seen what you've you know, built in the world, have seen what you know, you've done, the impact, uh, you know, they followed your story through the roller coaster, maybe they've watched Good Fortune, and they themselves might be stuck in a rut. Maybe, they're, maybe their business is you know, not doing so hot. Maybe they're a salesperson and they're debating quitting. Maybe their relationship's not doing so hot. Or maybe they're in a successful business, but they're unfulfilled. I'm sure you've seen it. Um, but they're just stuck in life. What would be John Paul DeJoria's best piece of advice to somebody out there who's just stuck and looking to make their life work? Go get, rent it, or buy it. It's only a few dollars now. Good fortune, the documentary movie. <laughs> Go, and you'll see what I mean once you see it, okay? It covers several times of being stuck, several times of being everything you could possibly imagine in your life, but how to overcome it with kindness in a good way. Watch that, I think it's gonna answer your questions. I love that. Okay, so you ready for the game? Sure. All right, here we go. So again, 10 words or phrases, first word that comes to mind. The only rule is that you can't repeat yourself twice. Mm -hmm. Makes sense? So the first word or phrase that comes Sure, to mind. let's give it a try. All right, first word, money. I just, to me, popped up mobile loaves and fishes because I was able to give them more money for the homeless people building an ecological center for them that gives you entrepreneurship and work. Mm -hmm. Challenges. Oh my gosh, all the ones I've been through for the last 74 <laughs> years. <laughs> uh, homelessness. I've been there twice. Your dreams. 
my dreams are still my dreams. And when it turns out in my life that my regrets take the place of my dreams, then I'm getting old. <laughs> passion. How you truly feel, passion is so strong, it's gotta be part of what you do, you're passionate about it, not just do it because you have to. The $5.1 billion acquisition with Bacardi and the Patron. Very nice valuation on the company, very nice valuation. Hit a home run, did something really, really good and gives me the opportunity to do other things and be very proud of being the founder of Patron Spirits. What your mom would say if she saw you right now in this office and what you built in the world. Johnny, I love you, that's my boy. <laughs> your wishes for people out there watching this interview who wanna make their life work. To make your life work, be sure that you look at those around you to make their life work at the same time. Then you move forward together. The frequency of this planet is rising. Every one of you out there, I don't care how old you are, have noticed this last year went by faster than any year in your life. The frequency is rising. Things are happening quicker. As you do things, make sure others in your life are part of it. Don't just single yourself out. And as you go along, help others along the way. Mm, beautifully put. And then teamwork. Teamwork is so important. If you are the boss and you have people telling them, them what to do without them being part of it, you're not gonna accomplish anything. A great example is when I was in the Navy. I went right out of high school, I was just an ordinary guy. But in the Navy, they teach ordinary guys like me and others how to work together as a team and achieve extraordinary results. We do that in our businesses. And then the last one, you ready? It's more of a question. Does money buy happiness? Money helps with happiness because you don't have to worry about not sleeping. It helps, but does it buy total happiness? Absolutely not. I know of some people that are very, very well off that aren't really happy or are over egotistical with themselves. They're only happy when something good happens to them, <laughs> not for others. To me, yeah. success and shared is failure. So what is happiness to you? This is the final question. What does happiness truly mean to John Paul? DeJoy? Happiness to me is how you feel, wake up in the morning with a happy face, knowing what you do is the greatest good for the greatest number, and that you're benefiting others on this planet while you're here. A little bit like paying some rent for being on the planet Earth and being fortunate enough to have a good life for you and your family. I love that. I feel like you would be just as happy whether you were a billionaire or not, you would be in this mindset. Would you agree? Yeah, I was, I've been a pretty happy guy most of my life. Yeah, yeah. the money was, definitely helps positive. the situation though. Money helps the situation, of course <laughs> it does. But if I had a choice of uh, being wealthy, but not as happy as I am, or as happy as I was when I wasn't wealthy, or trade it, and I'd take the happiness. Uh, in my opinion, in priorities in life are happiness first, health second, and wealth is the next one. Happiness and health, those are two things that are the most precious things you could have in your life. I love it. Well, thank you so much for being here. You're welcome. My pleasure, story. sir. Thank all you my so best much, to your Paul. audience. Absolutely. Peace, love, and happiness. Absolutely. We'll get yes. all cameras. <laughs> okay, and that one thank too. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, we'll see you guys next time. Make sure to check out the link below. We'll see you guys next time. Thank you for being one of the passionate few. If you guys enjoyed that video, be sure to hit that subscribe button right now because every week we bring you the very best in personal development content, interviews, and insights to help inspire you to take your life and your dreams and make them a reality. And also, if you want to know how to book dream guests the same way I have, you can check the link below for my top three secrets. So if you have a podcast or a show or whatever it is and you want to collaborate with them, if you click that link below, I'll give you those top three secrets to help you get in touch with anybody. And also, don't forget that The Passionate View is available on media platforms as well. So you can subscribe to the podcast. And until next time, thank you for being one of The Passionate Few.